Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Teaching and Singing Jazz Strategies for Success. My name is Felicia, and I will be running everything in the background for our session today. We're excited to host today's webinar, and I'm confident that today's presenter will give you lots of helpful tools and ideas to take back to your own teaching. And so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Tish Oni. International performing artist, author, and composer, Dr. Tish Oni tours worldwide as a symphony pops and big band soloist, jazz vocalist, voice pedagogue, and musicologist. An avid arranger and composer, she has arranged several hundred pieces for jazz combo, including contemporary jazz, great American songbook standards, and her originals. She has been a professor of voice and jazz for more than 20 years at several universities. Dr. Oni's book, Jazz Singing, A Guide to Pedagogy and Performance, was released in February of 2022 and has been widely acclaimed by world-class singers and voice teachers. Dr. Oni, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Okay, we're talking today about uh, teaching and singing jazz. And uh, I'd like to share some strategies for success. Um, this is for a lot of different uh, folks, for those who are established jazz singers, as well as beginning jazz singers, uh, choral directors, voice teachers who already teach jazz, and voice teachers who do not yet teach jazz, but who would like to learn some uh, tips and strategies for how they might implement it. Uh, and so here we go. Please uh, show the first slide. Thank you. The aims of, of this presentation are several. Uh, one is to suggest ways to introduce jazz into your applied voice studio for private lessons uh, or your choir rehearsal or your classroom. Uh, it's also for people singers of all ages so if you teach elementary school you might be able to use some of these techniques uh, or if you teach college uh, graduate students can also benefit uh, i'd like to offer ideas for helping teachers create their own exercises based on what they already do and what they uh, have proven works in their classroom I'd like to help working singers enhance their own performance and give you some, some fresh ideas, perhaps, for practicing and uh, explain some different styles of improvisation and strategies for creating a compelling improvised solo. Next slide, please. So as I said, uh, the target audiences for this, um, jazz singers, teachers of singing, students interested in singing jazz, voice pedagogy students in particular. Uh, as we know, the uh, voice teaching profession has expanded a lot in the last 15 years or so, and classical voice teachers, uh, traditional voice teachers are now being asked to do a lot more styles and to uh, include many different genres in their teaching arts. So uh, I have tried to help my colleagues as much as I can to give them ideas for uh, putting their toe into the pool of jazz and uh, taking a swim. Uh, also, instrumentalists often find themselves leading vocal ensembles, vocal combos or vocal jazz ensembles often are directed at the university level by very competent um, instrumentalists, guitar, players and pianists who maybe don't uh, sing themselves. So this information is also for them. Uh, choir directors implementing jazz in their rehearsals and performances, and also fans of classic jazz singing greats, because I think it's important for us to realize that these techniques and these ideas come from listening to those who really did it extremely well in the past. So we need to be um, listening to the greatest jazz singers. There's a, lot, there's a lot of different styles out there for um, listening to classic jazz singers, and um, they're all valid on some level. Next slide, please. Let's first talk about the neutral baseline voice. 
I like to talk about this because I'm a multi-genre singer. I sing this last weekend. I sang uh, a cantata, cantata 106 uh, by J.S. Bach with um, South Carolina Bach Society and the North Carolina um, Baroque Orchestra. And this weekend I'm teaching jazz singing. So uh, there's a lot of uh, parallels and there are a lot of ways that those of us that teach many styles and sing many styles can be true to the art form that we're doing today um, or this hour. Um, so you can you can find your natural baseline voice. It's not influenced by any genre or any style. Um, next. It has the characteristic of having balanced resonance. And what I mean by balanced resonance is a good mix between heavy and light mechanism. So head voice, chest voice, um, mode one, mode two, depends on uh, what you want to call it. Um, cricothyroid and thyroid muscle dominant um, action at the larynx level. Um, that's balanced resonance when both sets of muscles are participating. Uh, you use the neutral baseline voice when you warm up, when you learn pieces, when you are rehabilitating from illness, and it's really just your unadulterated, unaffected, raw, natural voice. When you're breathing well, when you're standing well, when you're sitting well, and uh, when you're phonating in a healthy way. You can add to and modify the baseline's vocal colors depending on whatever style you want to sing, whatever genre you're singing. And uh, so this gives you a foundation of good technique below uh, the stylisms that you want to add depending on whatever style you happen to be wanting to sing, whether it's German leader, whether it's Italian opera, whether it's contemporary jazz, whether it's musical theater, and there are a lot of styles of musical theater nowadays too. Um, you may want to be belting and uh, you think about how to mix that balanced resonance. Um, and so the net neutral baseline voice is the one that we come back to each day when we're warming up, when we're cooling down, and we, um, we need to keep this voice very healthy because that's our vocal fingerprint, basically. The, the neutral baseline voice is the healthy voice that we start with. Next. And we always want to use bod good body alignment, good posture, clear phonation, for the most part, when we're, when we're training and teasing out the neutral baseline voice, when we're warming up, use clear phonation, breath management, uh, good clean onsets, and other elements of healthy vocal technique then you can uh, modify that once you've warmed up your voice in a healthy way, you can modify that into whatever kind of jazz style, uh, special kinds of onset you want to use or breathiness, you could add that later, but you don't wanna to default to a naturally breathy sound all the time because that could be indicative of, of some kind of pathology at the level of the vocal folds. Next, please. For classical voice pedagogues and choir directors, I have good news for you. You can modify your favorite exercises to a jazz style and use them in your choirs and in your private lessons. You don't have to learn a whole lot of new exercises. Um, you can start with a familiar classical vocalise or a choral warm up, like. And then add a swing style to it with a couple of easy scat syllables. Do va 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 do. And then I also add a syncopation. And um, then you can modify that to a bossa nova, which is a straight eighth note feel. Do va 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 do. Notice how even though the first time I did the iteration of the exercise and that bossa nova time, they were the same rhythmically, 
but they weren't the same stylistically. One was more of a neutral baseline voice. And the other is more jazzy sounding. Duva, 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 du. It's it's very light, um, and the um, syllables just flow off the tongue and the teeth and the lips. And then have your students or yourself switch from a classical approach at the beginning in the original exercise to the swing approach, then to the bassa approach, and then back and forth among them, maybe on demand, and teach yourself and and your students how to go um, around the genres in that way singing the same pitches the same scalar uh, arpeggiated pattern or motif or exercise that you like and um, challenge yourself to do it in different styles and listen to great singers to add um, some some smears some slides some dips uh, a shake or something like that to practice in that way, much like the Marchese method for those of, those of you who know uh, Matilda Marchese's method of classical voice, bel canto, I've studied that for many years and I love those exercises. And so I go sometimes to that book and find some really neat exercises that help to build my vocal technique and I swing them or I add some jazz style to them and some, um, some, scat syllables and that's a fun way to introduce this to a classical student who already is familiar with these um, bel canto exercises and it's fun for you too as a teacher to um, to approach it in this way because it reminds you how much you already really know and um, it validates it for you so go ahead and use your own exercises i'd like to talk about a few different styles of improvisation uh, the first style, the first style I like to start with with beginners is text based improvisation and that it has not always been recognized in strict jazz circles uh, as being improvisation, although it really is. Um, and so text based improvisation happens when the text stays the same, it is kept in the song and in the solo, but it uh, you've cha you're changing the melody and the rhythm. So you might do, uh, I'll give you an example from a, an original song that I've composed called Year Round Blues. And um, here is the first iteration of it, the way I wrote it. I once knew a man now is no more he loved to spend his summers with me on the shore he liked to tell jokes and drink his champagne the way he disappeared was a crying shame and then there's a little different section in there uh, after that if i were to do a text-based improv of this i might do this i once knew a man who now was no more he loved to spend his summers with me on the shore. He liked to tell jokes and drink his champagne. The way he disappeared was a cry and shame. So I've left the melody kind of behind and I have kept the words in and changed them. And a lot of great jazz singers have done this through the years. Peggy Lee did this a lot. Sarah Vaughn did this. Um, to a great, great, great degree. Lots and lots of wonderful uh, jazz singers that we know and love start this way. And so then uh, if I were to go back to the slide, the next one is scat improvisation. And you can start scat improvisation by doing melodic, first of all, scatting the melody, scat the melody first, and then do a little embellishment off that and then go a little further out and I'll demonstrate this too. So first we're going to scat the melody that I've already written. Do 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 boo do boo 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 do 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 boo 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 boo
Okay, so that's exactly what's on the page. Now I'm going to embellish it a little bit. Uh, and then if I'm going to go further out from there, I have to really know the harmony and we'll get to that in a little bit, uh, scatting the root motion. Um, but then if you can, if you can um, scat the root motion, well, actually, why don't we do that first? We'll scat the root motion. And what is that? It's when I look at the, the lead sheet, I'm looking at the lead sheet and I am seeing the, the names of the chords. And we're going to, um, this is what I do with my students on a daily basis. If they're a jazz voice student, uh, they scat the, um, the bass line, the bass, the root motion, but they do it first with pitch names so that if it's an A minor seven chord going to F seven to E seven, they sing A, F, E, A. G, C, A, D, E, A, F, E, A, F, E, A, F, E, A. And that gives them a really sound um, foundation of what the bass player is going to do. Obviously, a great bass player is going to work around that, but they're going to lay down that bass line. And if the singer knows the bass line, the singer knows a lot more about the harmony than they did just knowing the melody, right? Yes. So if you want to be a great scat singer, you have to start with two things. Know the melody really well and know the, the root motion equally well so you can sing it, so you can scat it. And then once we have mastered the pitch names, have them sing pitch names, then we move into scatting that line instead of the, saying the pitch names. So then you would just do a oops, scatting. Do ba ba boo 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 ba boo do 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 ba boo boo ba ba do. And you can add little um, bass stylizations too, like I just did. I added a little triplet do ba ba do 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 ba boo do do da do do boo and i'm doing a little bit of uh percussive sounds with my my tongue and teeth to just kind of give you that swing feel too and it helps you to feel that um to play a little a little bit of the drums to play a little bit of the bass you know with your with your vocal mechanism with your with your mouth all right, and then you can go further out from here because you have mastered the bass line, the root motion. And of course, um, once we do that, uh, I like to give my students an, an exercise in arpeggiating the chord progression next. So they go home and it takes at least a week, usually more than a week um, to really master. But once they can sing the, the pitch names of the roots, then they can arpeggiate them too. Et cetera. Okay, and you can slow it down for them so that it's it's something that they can do at um, at a steady tempo, nice and slowly first, and then pick it up to um, performance speed. And then before you know it, once you have all of those bodies of pitch repertoire, the melody and and um, melodic embellishment moving outside the melody and then the um, singing the pitch names of the roots and arpeggiating all of the chords you've got so much material that you can use for uh, building us a, a great scat solo and you can keep on going out and then so i might uh, d demonstrate if i'm using the bass line first and then 
and then the the melody i'll alternate between thinking about the bass line and the melody okay and then beyond that you don't have to use the melody or the bass line you've got all of those uh pitches in your brain that you can choose from and re um make a new tapestry out of it Etc. 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 Okay. So uh, those those are step by step way of approaching jazz improvisation in your voice studios, and you can also adapt that in your choral um, rehearsals, um, especially for small small choral groups, vocal jazz ensembles, vocal jazz combos, and so forth. Let's go back to the slide, please. I'm going to jump in here really quick with a question, actually. Cynthia asked, I think in response to you talking about having your singers sing the pitches, she says, can you sing on solfege syllables for the chords? Yes, you can. Absolutely. That's another, another great skill to, um, to develop. The problem with doing that is a lot of the time in a jazz piece of the great American songbook standard, yet the key changes. And so when the key changes, like at the bridge, often you have to reestablish where, where do is. So as long as you can do that and acknowledge that with the student, absolutely. I use solfege every day, all the time, but just keep that in mind that with a, a jazz lead sheet, sometimes the tonal center gets a little obscured. Great question. Okay, and then so we've talked about scat improvisation, melodic embellishment, going further out, step by step, going further out, um, and then you can also use long tones, and I love long tones, especially in modal pieces, um, because a long tone uh, in in modes when you're singing modal music, all of the notes in the mode tend to go with all the chords that the mode is going to um, utilize. So I'll, I'll demonstrate with another original song called Waltz for Ellie, which is a um, based on the Dorian mode. So I'll scat using long tones. So that's a really great way to introduce uh, improvisation for beginners. Uh, it, train them to use long tones, and then also when you're starting a solo, using long tones in a in a, a, a Dorian mode uh, when it's appropriate uh, for the song can lead you into a busier busier second chorus. So if you want to take a, a, a multi-chorus solo. The first, it's it's, na it's a natural progression to use long tones first and then get busier later. So my second chorus it might might be lead it, led into like this. Do, do, ba, ba. Ba, 
Okay, but then when you get busier, then you created some beautiful contrast over the solo. So it doesn't just all sound like, you know, like a lot of uh, 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 beginners are trying to do. So it gives, gives you a, a pattern to follow. It can give you a recipe to follow for those of us that like recipes. Um, so just some suggestions for you to ease into improv. And the next slide, or the, back to the same slide, please. Then there's also vocalise, which is something really very advanced. It's a style that vocal jazz ensembles tend to uh, enjoy doing. And um, John Hendricks is really the granddaddy of vocalise. What uh, he used to do is, um, he was really among the first to start setting lyrics to already established transcriptions of great jazz solos. So he would take uh, a solo or several solos, um, like the, the great song Four Brothers is a vocalise now uh, with the lyrics that were added by John Hendricks um, that the Manhattan Transfer recorded. Um, and that is a, a song based on the solos of all the saxophone players in Four Brothers on that tune. It was an instrumental tune and it was uh, added, the, the lyrics were added later. So that's vocalise. It's very fast. It tends to be very fast and bebop um, style. And it's not something for the faint of heart or for beginners, but uh, for your more advanced students in your vocal jazz ensemble, it's a real lot of fun to do some vocalese. You can also do lyric improvisation. Bessie Smith, uh, the Empress of the Blues back in the 1920s was uh, very famous. She was one of the very first blues superstars all over the world, a recording star. She would go into the recording studio and um, just make up the lyrics and rhyme them and come out with uh, 12 or 15 new, new recorded songs based on the blues. Uh, and uh, she would rhyme the first two lines, or actually the first two lines would be identical and the third line would be a rhyming with that first and second line. And so that was Bessie's, um, one of Bessie's real strengths and encouraging yourself and your students to be creative with lyrics is a very, very good thing for your brain. And uh, to get some people to come um, and join the fun. Some people don't really like to scat. You'll find as you're teaching, uh, there's some students that really don't feel comfortable using scat syllables, at least at first. But boy, they've got some great ideas with lyric improvisation, or like the, the question that was asked before, uh, they might be excellent at scatting through solfege syllables using solfege. And I had a, a friend in college that could do that really well. And so when he came to the microphone to do a scat solo, he didn't scat per se, but he sang solfege correctly. <laughs> Even chromatic solfege, it was really quite amazing. He was a theory major and, and uh, made us all really appreciate all of our music theory knowledge. Um, and then you can also move move out of that uh, into free improvisation over time. Uh, free improvisation is a lot of fun to just experiment with with your students. Um, yes, there are rules to it. I'm not going to get into that very deeply today, but I thought I'd mention it that further out from some of these styles that are really based soundly on the harmony that you hear and see on the page. Free improv improvisation is a little bit further out and there are scales that you can work on and um, types of techniques and books that are highly recommended for exploring some of that. 
uh, that, that will be later on my resources page. Next slide, please. Okay, so when you're beginning improvising, and we've gone through this a little bit already, um, start with a melody. Make sure it's absolutely accurate. It needs to really be the melody. Don't just make it sort of the melody. So um, I'm very strict about this. As much as I love to improvise, if, if my students don't know every single pitch and rhythm of the melody, how it's supposed to go, if they're fudging it already from the beginning, that's not okay. They need to know first and foremost how the song goes because that also informs the harmony. And if they are fudging the melody, then they're, they're likely to also fudge the harmony, which is, is also not okay. They need to know both very, very well. Then you can add ornamentation and style to that melodic um, knowledge. You learn the root motion, which we talked about. Uh, you can analyze and scat arpeggios of the chord progression after that. Um, I also recommend using common practice patterns like 251 and the 12 bar blues progression. So I have an exercise that I like to use with 251, and I, I have my students in vocal jazz ensembles um, loop this. And um, so you're just going to, it's going to be a, a four measure motif that I repeat over and over again. D minor seven to G seven to C major seven for two bars. D minor seven, which is the two, G seven, which is the five seven, back to C, which is one. And we are just arpeggiating up and down those chords in a swing style, and it sounds really fun. Excuse me a second. So what am I doing? I'm doing one, three, five, seven, five, three, one in D, which hits the G seven. Of course, the the one of D D minor is the five of G seven. Do ba do ba do va. So I just arpeggiated up and down the G7, and then I landed on the seventh of C. Do ba do ba do ba do. And then we just connect it with a little turnaround. Do ba do do da. And then go around. Do ba do ba do ba do. Do ba bu da bu ba. Do ba bu ba do ba bu. Do ba do do da. And then I have my students add in swing feel by emphasizing every other eighth note do ba do ba do ba do do ba do ba do ba do ba do the off beats um and laying back the eighth notes too so they're a little bit delayed um kind of like a tied triplet at first but then even further back than the last triplet is a more authentic swing that's right in the groove. Okay, so that's a good exercise that you can use. And then the 12 bar blues progression, of course, uh, is another great place to start. You can use a uh, blues scale over any of the parts of the 12 bar blues. All of the notes in that scale go with all of the sections in all of the measures of that 12 bar blues. Back to the slide, please. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Then you could also use rhythm changes or other contrafacts. So rhythm changes just means I got rhythm chord changes from George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm. And that song has created more contrafacts than probably any other song um, in history. What is a contrafact? A contrafact is something that, that ha um, was popular in the bebop era where um, bebop musicians would take a uh, Tin Pan Alley song or um, 
a, an old standard, like I got rhythm and change the melody, but keep all of the chords and that it becomes a different song. So the same chord progression, also called chord changes, is used for all of these different songs that sound, they don't really sound like I got rhythm because the melodies are all different, but the harmony is the same. That's, that's contrafacts and we use them a lot in jazz. Um, then you can also work toward harmonic mastery using chord extensions when you're ready. So you're using, when you're arpeggiating, you use the one, the three, the five, the seven, I always use the seven because the seven makes it a, a jazz chord as opposed to a rock chord. Rock tends to play uh, with triads, except for over five, seven, which is also a seventh chord. But major quality chords um, often have a seventh in jazz. And then the nine, the sharp 11, and the 13. Now I didn't sharp the 11 in this PowerPoint because uh, it's a sharp 11 generally when you're playing uh, a major quality chord. But when you're playing in the minor, the natural 11 is actually, sounds really good. So if I were to play D minor seven, nine, 11, 13, that doesn't sound terrible. <laughs> it sounds really nice. Um, and so we keep the 11 in there as a natural 11 when we play it in a minor key often. And, um, we, we normally sharp it when we play major. Uh, syllables, people, one of my, the most common questions I get as a jazz educator is what syllables do I use? They can be basic. Uh, just do and va, bu, va, um, do, da, bu, ba. Essentially, there are syllables that, that help you to imitate an instrument. So you want to remember that when you're scatting, the point is that you are using your voice as an instrument. And so uh, when, it, uh, when it all began, scat singing was um, really an imitative art form whereby singers would emulate the sound of a trumpet or a clarinet or a flute or a trombone or some other improvising instrument um, and keep that in mind. You can ask yourself, okay, does my voice resemble a tuba or a flute? Does my voice resemble a trombone or a clarinet? Does my voice resemble a trumpet? You know, and, and sometimes you can use this as a, as a pedagogical tool teachers, because if you're, if your uh, singer sings a little too much, like a, a breathy flute, you can ask them to play more like a recorder or like a um, trumpet, which has a little bit more focus in the tone. So you, you can be strategic about asking for different things when you're teaching jazz and, and initiate um, conversation and demonstration uh, in your lessons about how would I imitate this sound of a trumpet or a clarinet, or a flute, you know? Um, you can also use open versus closed vowels, and this is something I discovered on my own. Um, the acoustic properties of, um, of the vowels can maximize your swing feel, and Ella Fitzgerald knew this on some, some level, some foundational, fundamental level. She knew it and instinctively did it, so if you listen to her scatting, a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, the open vowels fall on the off beats, which are the part of the beat that we're trying to bring out. We're trying to accent the off beats, use an open vowel because acoustically the volume is greater already without our having to try to force that to happen and use a closed vowel on the down beats, which we're trying to de-emphasize. So, do va do va do va do va do va do va. Now, if I reversed it, va do va do va do va do va do va da. I can't even do it. 
that doesn't swing. <laughs> that doesn't swing. And the, I'm not doing anything differently except that nature of the acoustics of the vowel, the laws of physics are helping me swing when I strategically place the open vowel that has a, a bigger resonance and more volume naturally in my mouth and coming through the microphone um, on the offbeat. So light bulb, use that, use that information. Um, and you can keep on going further out of the safe haven of the melody by using your inner ear and the harmony that's given use um, scales and arpeggios that work in that harmonic progression um, use motives and licks that you've heard other performers use and that's where transcription comes in very handy um, transcription is when you write down what someone else has played um, so transcribing is one of the basic tools that every jazz musician um, every accomplished jazz musician tends to do uh, you turn on the, you know, you turn on your music player and you get your manuscript paper out and you start writing, you write down the rhythm and the pitches of this particular improvised solo, like a, a Lester Young um, 32 bar solo is a wonderful thing for a singer to be able to do, to sit down and write. Um, and they can use the piano, you know, you can, you can have them use the piano as a guide, as a, as a help, or just to be able to sing it into the piano and see what it is and then write it down and then check it and see if it really matches. So transcribing is something that's very important for young musicians to be able to do. And you, that's where we get our motives and our licks by uh, listening to others and writing it down so you don't forget um, what your bag of tricks uh, contains, which uh, my vocal jazz director in college, Dave Riley, used to call all of our licks that we're learning. It's your bag of tricks, add it to your bag of tricks and you'll have it there when you want them. Uh, so that's good advice. Next slide, please. Jazz voice techniques, there are so many. Uh, one is back phrasing which is where a, uh, a singer delays or anticipates the beginning of a new phrase and pushes themselves into a rhythmic corner where they have to get out of, uh, of that. So in other words, if I were to do, uh, let me give you an example of back phrasing. I'll do um, a bit from Speak Low by Kurt Violin Ogdig Nash. Speak low when you speak love. Our summer day withers away too soon, too soon. So I waited a really long time before I started. That's back phrasing. If I were to do it the way it's written, speak low. When you speak love, but back phrasing starts a little later and then has you play with the rhythm until it, it works out according to lining up with the musical phrase by the end. Okay, so you can, you can go over. It doesn't have to end precisely at the musical phrase every time, but you don't want to be late so often that the band starts thinking that you don't know where you are. So back phrasing takes a lot of practice and it takes uh, a trusting band to do it with you too, so that they know that you've got uh, that form in your mind and you know exactly and precisely where they are. But if you're in a slightly different spot, you, they know that you're gonna catch up with them at some point and that's back phrasing. Back to the slide, thank you, she, she's reading my mind. Uh, colorful timbres, and I like to think of you adding and subtracting breathiness as as colorful timbres. So you can you can make a more a more nasal sound for a particular reason in your song. Um, a lot of scat singers like to sing 
with a little more nasality, especially when they're singing bebop style, because the greater nasality adds a little more uh, point to the sound and helps them to hear better. Somehow inside our own head, nasality enables our inner ear to hear a, a little bit better than um, if we're singing in a very breathy way. Um, but at the same time, uh, you also want to be able to add breathiness or breathlessness um, as a as a uh, color. And so um, that's where adding it to the baseline natural voice, neutral voice is is the thing to do to have that clean um, sound that you can t uh, tweak a little bit. Um, you can use overtones and vowel modification. Uh, and let's see, mic technique, I go into a little bit later. I'll skip it for now. Ornaments like the fall off. Um, a fall off is where you fall off the end of a, of a note. Ah, so speak low would be a fall off at the end of the word low. A shake is like a trill, but it's a little bit more um in vocal jazz a shake it is very clearly two pitches that you're oscillating between yes that would be more of a shake it's slower generally than a than a trill a doit is the opposite of a fall off doit it goes upward uh, think trumpet section shout chorus uh, and it's often used in a vocal jazz ensemble arrangements. The slide takes us from one pitch to another, um, sliding all the way through in between. It can be a descending slide or an ascending slide. And the ghost, which is uh, notated as an X uh, on the, in place of the note head on an eighth note or sometimes a 16th note, um, it's really just a little guttural sound that produce, uh, precedes a note. Um, if I were to do a ghost, a do, 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 it's the uh that I'm saying, a do, 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 a do, 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 that's a ghost. So it takes some practice too. It takes some vocal control. You don't want to actually sing a do do do. That doesn't sound right, but you have to de-emphasize it. It's like a a little schwa. Um, it's a de-emphasized sound uh, that precedes another note, and it also swings usually as you're doing it in swing style most often. You can vary rhythm rhythm as an um, improvisational choice. Um, a lot of times I, I hear students that are beginning scat singers doing the same rhythm, the same eighth note kind of run rhythm. And I always encourage them to think in terms of phrases and to vary the rhythm of their phrases so that the rhythm is just as interesting as, as um, the pitch. Because we have rhythm, right, that we can use to vary what we want to do. Uh, let's see. Instrumental tools, tools of the trade include scales, of course, arpeggios, pattern sequences, step progressions. These are huge. Um, these are very important, especially when you're stepping through circles of fifths. These are wonderful tools to use. Repetition, um, use doing something over and over again. Imitation, imitating somebody else who is on the bandstand with you when you're trading sometimes you imitate you listen to one another and you have a conversation and you take the end of what that person did and make it the beginning of what you're about to say um, you can use transcribed licks and quotations what's a quotation a quotation is when a singer or yeah a singer or an instrumentalist plays a piece of another song a recognizable snippet of another song within their solo. And that's always fun to do. Um, 
I recommend practicing the difference between swing and bossa feel, going back and forth between them, using dynamics to shape phrases. Um, I don't hear enough dynamic contrast in most uh, college vocal jazz ensembles or high school vocal jazz ensembles. So I love to challenge them to use dynamics to shape their phrases. Um, also, as far as solo singing goes, be sure you're respecting the breath phrasing. Don't breathe in the middle of a word. Even if pop singers do it, don't do it. <laughs> I'm old school when it comes to this. Uh, always observe the, um, the lyricist's intent. Okay, and the, the composer's intent, we're, we're singing their music, so we need to bring respect to that music. Um, and listen to phrasing experts, and you're going to hear some phrasing experts before we leave this webinar. There's no single correct way to sing jazz or to approach jazz, and I want to make sure that that is said. And that is one of my main takeaways, is that there are so many right ways to do this art form. There's not just one way. There is not one um, assembly line education that you can get or should get, and then you graduate from it, and, and there you are, a successful jazz singer. There's so many approaches, and the more um, wonderful singers you listen to, the more that's going to inform your own uniqueness as a jazz singer. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm not sure how much time we have left. Uh, microphone technique, Felicia, I trust you to just interrupt me if, I, if I'm going on too long, you but um, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, uh, the mic is half of the singer's instrument. I'm going to say that again. The mic is half of the singer's instrument. So if you use it correctly, singers, um, it will make you look really good. It will make you sound really good. You have to be selective and do your homework before you buy a microphone. Uh, microphones are very unique, kind of like uh, the wands in Harry Potter would pick the, uh, the wizard. <laughs> the wand picked the wizard. Um, microphones are the same way. You're not gonna sound your best um, from just anybody else's mic uh, necessarily. Their voice might sound fabulous through it, but yours is yours. The quality of the singing has to be very high or the weaknesses will be amplified through a microphone. So uh, jazz singers, be under, understanding that you, you, a mic is definitely not a hiding place. It is, boy, oh boy, it's the opposite. If you, um, if you ever get up in front of an audience and you're not prepared, the mic is not going to help you. It's going to advertise uh, that point and amplify it. Your rhythm and your pitch have to be ultra precise when you're singing with a mic, and so you need to be um, comfortable with it at, a, at the proper level. Make sure that um, you talk to the technical director if you're doing a concert, and make sure that you're not getting um, feedback on your sibilance. You know, do the S's and T's to be sure that that's a nice dull sound coming through the mic and not too trebly uh, because too many high partials can really wreak havoc on people's ears eardrums in uh, in sound tech check accidents and so forth um, your dynamics can be partly controlled with closeness to the mic you can pull it away occasionally if you're going to sing a really high note i like to pull my mic away just out of courtesy to the audience i don't want them to to be shocked when i sing my high c this is too close if I'm going to sing my high C. So be aware of that. And hold your microphone with your fingertips one or two inches from uh, your mouth. So this is too far away for singing jazz. Generally, this is too far away. And you don't want your lips touching it either. OK, so um, don't uh, white knuckle it like a fist, but let it gently be held supportively with um, good control of your fingers because then it looks a lot more natural for your audience and it also feels more natural than this this can add to your tension all the way up your arm this will help you to relax your shoulder and your arm next slide um, i always 
assign my students scale exercises and myself because scale uh, jazz improvisation requires so much scale knowledge and and ability to deliver scales. Um, you got to develop your inner ear and this helps a great deal teach your students a few new scales every semester have them practice away from the piano, you know, with the piano nearby sometimes, but then make them do it without and, and check themselves so that they don't have to have a piano around to do their warm ups to sing their songs to learn their transcriptions to do anything else in jazz. Uh, I spent a lot of time away from the piano. Um, I didn't even have a piano in my first uh, year at <laughs> USC as a doctoral jazz major. I didn't have a piano at home. So I did it all in my head and boy was that good for my inner ear. Oh my gosh, jazz composition class. Yeah, that was great for my ears. It was great. So challenge your students and yourself and make yourself do it um, just by listening to the pitches inside your head, okay? Uh, freshman year, for example, and you can do this at the middle school level, you can do this progressively for any level. You can start with major and minor scales. Of course, the minor is not just one kind of minor, but all three natural, melodic, and harmonic minors and test your students off and test yourself. Give yourselves um, arpeggios to do on those scale patterns and different patterns and different licks and different um, fragments of the scales. In sophomore year, I would add the blues scale, the chromatic scale, and the pentatonic scales. Junior year, we added the whole tone scale and all seven Gregorian modes because we jazz musicians use them all. And jazz singers need to be just as adept at using them and knowing when to use them uh, as their instrumental counterparts, if not more so because you're often leading the band and you don't get to look at the, the, the chart. As, as often as the band does. Uh, senior year, I would add bebop scales. And those are, there's a couple different kinds. I'm not gonna get deeply into them because of time, but they are major, Mixolydian, and Dorian. Those three are the ones that I present um, of the bebop scales to my advanced students. And then other scales that are specific to jazz, like the half step up melodic minor scale that is useful over dominant harmony. That's an advanced graduate student level scale. Um, very difficult to um, sing, but it's worthwhile to study. Next slide, please. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip over the arranging a lead sheet part um, just for the sake of time. Um, thank you. And, and I'm gonna just say, let the masters teach you, listen to great jazz singing transcribe their, their solos, work with sing-along tracks, and study the techniques and approaches of the greats. I like to listen to Nancy Wilson's um, recording of The Very Thought of You. To keep by my bed Your picture is always In my head I don't need your portrait, dear To call you to mind For sleeping or waking Dear Yeah. <laughs> 
though it may seem to me that's everything the mere idea of you Thank you, Felicia. Nancy did just um, did a perfect example of someone doing back phrasing and using breathiness in the middle of her words without sacrificing vocal clarity. And her style of breathiness uh, was to insert an H in the middle of a word, like, I don't need your photograph, is what she's saying. And so she came through as breathless, but without ever sacrificing that clarity of her voice. She also used fall offs and um, a little bit of dipping into vocal fry just for an effect. Um, and lots of ornaments, lots of smears to connect uh, her singing. Um, so that is a really excellent example, I think, of uh, an artist exemplifying um, using ornaments and jazz style to create her very own rendition, beautiful, beautifully sung rendition and healthfully sung rendition of a great standard. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to let you, you know about my jazz theory column that I write. It's called Anatomy of a Standard and I analyze the, the lyrics and the music alongside one another and, and talk about how the marriage of those two create a lasting work of art. So that's something you can share with your students. It's that all about jazz. There's about 12 iterations, 12 different standards that I've analyzed so far, and I'm going to keep that going. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to it. It's had a very popular following. It's had about an, a million page views so far, which is exciting. You can also connect with me on social media or at my um, my website tishoni.com and the next slide will show my new book called jazz singing a guide to pedagogy and performance um, and that has been a real joy um, it's been very well received by the journal of singing and uh, a number of other um, a number of great voices in the jazz circles and great voices in the classical circles as well. So uh, I'm blessed to, to share information from that book with you today. And uh, I also wanted to point out Shelley Berg's Jazz Improvisation, the Gold Note Method is a fabulous resource for advanced improvisers. You'll have plenty of very difficult and accessible um, exercises and suggestions in that wonderful book. Also, multiple publications by Michelle Weir, Bob Stoloff, Joe Raposo, Jamie Abersold, and Dharma Meter, and, and several others, but those in particular are a great um, uh, library of resources. Each, each one of these authors has written more than one uh, great um, staple in the vocal jazz literature that I want to point you toward for ideas and for um, for great help teaching and singing. So I appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much, Felicia. Thank you, Andy Beck. Thank you, Alfred 
uh, music publishing for having me here and it's been a thrill and i'd love to answer your questions if we have any more time thank you so much we actually did if you have a minute to answer one more question sure um let me find it sorry cynthia asked what about breath support exercises and the use of chest voice as opposed to head voice yeah wow well that that could go on for quite a while but what about breath support um well just like any other kind of singer jazz singers need the same um the same worked out muscles they the understanding of the diaphragm and uh its role in inhalation and the abdominal muscles and their role in exhalation as well as the internal and external intercostal muscles between the ribs that enable you to expand in that bu bucket handle motion as you inhale and as you exhale um, it's always good uh, no matter what kind of singer you are to be able to master that exhalation so that you don't collapse your your rib cage um, so there there's a lot of exercises in this the, this book that I've written that uh, really speak to that. And as far as the chest voice goes, um, great question. Yes, we we sing in a spoken range in jazz. And so it's important when, you, when you're transposing songs and putting them into your key, that your key is a comfortably spoken key so that you can literally sing, speak the, the song all the way through from the lower notes to the higher notes if possible with a little bit of mix you know in in the top that's that's how you know that the key is right for you um it can't be out of range at any point it can't be too high in one note or too low for one note um but the chest voice uh i like to think of as a a mix i've i've done a um i've copywritten a mix continuum which is a, a graph in the book, um, which is helps students and singers to um, to mix their head and chest in such a way so that it's mostly chest on the bottom and with a little bit of head voice so that you can go up and up and up and up seamlessly into your full head voice without there being a big break. So I think that's helpful for jazz singers as well as classical singers, because um, in my mind, what you just heard Nancy Wilson do is sing her beautiful, beautiful mix all the way throughout her range. She uses a lot of chest voice in the bottom. She uses a lot of head voice in the top. But because she uses a mix all the way through, you don't hear the separation. Sarah Vaughan was another perfect example of that. But again, there's no right or wrong way of um, approaching jazz singing. And so my goal is simply to help each singer and each teacher find a healthy way that their voice will do it. And um, that mix continuum will help with the resonance in that way because it's different for everyone. It's, a, it's, an, um, it's something that you can tailor to your own particular vocal instrument. Thanks for the question. Thank you. That is all of the questions that we have on the list today. So thank you so much, Dr. Oni, for, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with everyone here today. And to our audience, thank you all for joining us. We know that you have very busy lives and we hope that this was helpful and informational and interesting and, and that you can take it with you into your own teaching. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone at our next webinar and hope you have a wonderful weekend and thank you again. Thank you.